we are really excited to have here with us today Miss Ka Walla um, of Cameroon, who is a remarkable entrepreneur and grassroots activist and elected official. Um, to start, perhaps you could talk to us a little bit about um, some of the strategies that you have used to empower women in Cameroon. I think the you know the start is al always for me for uh, with anything. Um, having a vision and I have a vision of Cameroonian women um, really occupying the place in leadership that they occupy in terms of the the role that they play in the society Cameroonian women are the backbone of Cameroonian society they are extremely active socially economically um, and I think it's really um, we're going to be a better society once we get women as part of the decision-making process. Um, so starting from there, we have carried out a number of strategies. One um, that was really key was in 1998, we brought women together who were leaders from traditional societies, um, religious communities, civil society, uh, political leaders to talk about um, it had been about 10 years of gender and development in, in Cameroon at that time, and we said after 10 years of, of gender, um, where are we and where do we need to be? And that meeting, um, I think, was very decisive for a lot of Cameroonian women. I think it was even decisive for me personally because we realized that where we were not was where decisions were being made. And most importantly, within the political sphere, because um, the political sphere y y uh, creates the, the framework and the environment for everything else, for everything you're going to do economically and, and socially. So we, we, we came to that conclusion after that, that, that meeting of, of women leaders from across the country. And I think since then we have carried out programs of training um, because key is just getting women to understand um, the political framework within which they find themselves. I think women tend to be at an operational level, taking care of business, taking care of kids, taking care of um, you know the human beings in the society, feeding them, clothing them, you know, making sure that they're healthy, um, and also um, you know being very active economically. And too often we do not stop to think. Why are things this, the way they are? Who's taking the decisions that make things this way? And is there something that we can do about it? So um, we've put into place a number of training programs to um, help women to do that. We've put into place mentoring programs so that um, women you know, have a mentor that they can go to and ask for questions. And the third aspect is networks. I think it's very, very important for women to have um, a safe place where they're with just with other women. They don't feel like they're stepping out of bounds or taking an enormous risk just by asking a question or by raising an issue. And I think it's also important for women to talk to one another and to understand what their common positions are, what their differences are, because definitely there is no woman's position, <laughs> um, um, but you know, coming to, to determine all that before they get into the public sphere where they now have to communicate those positions and defend those positions and, and, and promote or advocate for them. Where do you see the most, um, the most systemic change so far mm -hmm. and how do you see that change continuing once the people who are currently involved are no longer involved, so mm -hmm. in the future. I think in the work that I've done, I see two areas where we have made um, significant sy systemic strides. Right now, Cameroon has um, just in the last election doubled the number of women who are in parliament. We were able to get into the law in Cameroon that um, uh, candidates list, because we, go, we are elected by a list system, um, that lists that come up for election have to be gender sensitive. Um, and that ensured that during the last election, all political parties across the board 
were ensuring that they had women candidates. Um, and that translated itself in Parliament to the number of women um, who won seats. So we, we, we doubled um, the from 25 out of 180 parliamentarians to 50 out of 180. Um, which is a very significant jump in one in one election. I, I feel that that's a systemic change that's gonna s going to stay. I think that um, you know women in Cameroon are already talking about we need to move from the law just saying that it's gender sensitive to a specific quota, a specific percentage. Um, so I think that if we manage to get that through, um, that will be a step forward that that you know, will remain no matter who, um, who is in place. The other group of women that uh, I feel are making strides are women in the informal sector. Um, we have done tremendous work in, first of all, helping women in the in, in informal sector, especially non-agricultural, so informal sensitive. These are women who sell in markets, who sell on the side of the street, and so on. Um, and what we've done is to, one, help them to monetize their contribution to the economy because they do not see themselves as economic players and no one else sees them as economic players. But when you begin to monetize what they contribute to a local economy um, and the number of jobs that they create, um, it's a really significant contribution um, to the economy. So that analysis has really changed their perception of themselves and also enables them to engage with local city officials, with um, a government from a very different stance. Um, and I think that that work is still, we're still continuing with it, but I do see those women building up. They've created associations, so they now have voice. Um, I believe that they are going to continue to advocate for uh, better working conditions, the infrastructure that would enable them to actually grow their businesses. Um, and I think that they're also we're going to see systemic change. So you, I hear you talking a lot about networks and leadership through networks and other people. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about your own experience running for president. I think the biggest lesson I, the biggest leadership lesson that I learned uh, in running for president uh, is actually, um, I had once read a, a poem of an African-American writer, Haki Madabuti, and the title of the poem is Run Towards Fear. Um, and I think I learned to run towards fear <laughs> uh, during, during the presidential campaign. Uh, taking a political stance in a, ca a country like Cameroon includes danger. It includes, you, you have to be aware that there is a physical danger, um, there is a social and economic danger, um, and so most people fear, um, and, and they, their fear is legitimate because things mm -hmm. can happen to you. Um, but what do you what do you do? Um, I, it, it, to me, it came down to what am I most afraid of? Am I afraid of uh, being in a country that is headed down a path at the end of which there is only catastrophe, uh, in, 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 in my opinion? Um, or am I afraid of standing up and, and you know, leading people towards a different path and what that might mean um, to me? So what I learned was that, um, I, fortunately for me, the fear of catastrophe was stronger than the fear of standing up. <laughs> uh, and so I stood up, and then I learned that, you know, as you, as you run towards your fear, as you face it, it disappears, right? Because the, w what we are afraid of is what's unknown, right? And, and all of a sudden you're there and you're doing it, and you realize, I'm not afraid. <laughs> um, um, and so um, I think that was a very big lesson in leadership for me um, that you know you're thinking it you're feeling it you believe in it do it do it just just stand up and do it and it doesn't matter whether you have all the answers 
Whether you have it figured out, I definitely didn't have it figured out before I started. I still don't have it figured out. Um, but start doing it and um, the th what to do will begin to, to make sense to you. If you do have a vision, if you have defined this is where I'm going, um, you figure out the path to that place as you go along. Um, so I think that's a very big lesson in leadership. The uh, second huge lesson in leadership for me um, that has become stronger politically but was already very clear for me as a business person is that you are as strong as your team. You are as strong as your, your team. Having people working with you um, who are really, really smart, <laughs> who really, really believe in um, the objective, in the vision, uh, but also have, it's, I think it's important to share a set of principles and of values because um, I do believe that how you get somewhere is important. It's, you, you want to reach an objective, but how you do it is, is important um, and, it, and is, in my opinion, a part of the objective itself. Um, so, you know, ha having teams, building teams, investing in people, um, I think is a huge leadership lesson um, that I learned. Uh, I think also failing. I was not really good at failing before politics. <laughs> um, uh, and, um, you know, when you decide to confront a political system that has been in place for over 50 years and that has had a huge impact on the population, um, that doesn't feel like they're going anywhere or anything is going to change, um, you're going to fail. Uh, you're going to fail a few times before you succeed. Um, so having to deal with failure and learn from, from, from failure and um, also allow myself to go through the pain of failure to to acknowledge that you know I failed and I'm really upset about it right now um, and taking the time to go through that process because I think that's where you learn that's where you begin to draw lessons and that's where you begin to have enough strength to step back and and look at things differently um, and um, People ask me, you know, are you going to run again for president? And I always say I'm running right now <laughs> um, for president because I, what, what I'm running for is a change for my country. And, I, and I, I believe in that change. And I have stumbled more times along the way than I thought uh, I would, um, th that I thought, I deserved, you know, when we started this, I thought we're right and we what we're doing is just and it's correct and so we'll win, of course. <laughs> um, and and it doesn't quite work that way, but I but um, you know I've learned to stay on that path and to understand that my job is to be on that path and to mm -hmm. to remain true um, to that objective. Um, and to bring as many people along and, and do the work, take the time, make the investment necessary for more Cameroonians to see that alternative, to understand also that they don't deserve where they are today. Because I think when you beat people down enough for mm -hmm. several decades, they begin to believe that this is all that is possible for them that this is all this is their lot in life so um, working with Cameroonians to to help people to see that no this is not your lot in life and you can act and make a difference it as concerns your own life and definitely your future is really hard grueling day-to-day -day work can you talk a little bit about how to engage how people can work together in good teams, especially mm -hmm. if they traditionally haven't worked together very well, mm -hmm. like in terms of gender or ethnicity, um, how to take that forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, th um, I think an amazing thing for me, I have had the, the, the privilege of 
um, growing up and going to school in an environment where people worked in teams. And for me, it was a very sort of natural thing t to do. And when I started in Cameroonian politics, I discovered that, no, it's not natural. And there are a lot of people who are uh, haven't had that experience, haven't had an experience of being in a supportive, collaborative, inclusive environment. Um, and I think that one of the things in leadership is to establish that and to be unwavering on that in a team, to make it very, very clear. And I think in politics more so than, than business, um, which you, know, you, you may want to be a bit more competitive in uh, and so on. But in politics, you want to establish that this is an environment where we will include everybody, we will support one another, and we will work together um, to achieve our objectives. Um, I think one is communicate, articulating that, communicating it, and in terms of the leadership being unwavering on that. Second is to train people because we, we you know, what I just said sounds really nice, but it's like, how do you do that? <laughs> um, how do you make that happen? It takes certain kinds of tools in the way you work. It takes, you know, you organize meetings in a particular way. You give people opportunity who are not necessarily those who would um, naturally come to the, to the forefront, right? So um, it does take training and, and putting into place tools and working methods that enable that to, um, to happen. Um, it also takes, um, being very clear and firm when you have individuals on the team who are not behaving in that, in that way, who, who do not respect those, um, those boundaries. Everyone we interview, we always have the last question be about um, your personal idea of what peace and security means. Mm. Um, so if you can speak about that in, in terms of how it means to you and your experience and your context. I think that you know it's the the word peace in the Cameroonian context is a controversial word. <laughs> interestingly, because um, you, when you live in a country that's a dictatorship, they use pe they use um, lack of change. So not having change, not having things alternate, not having, you know, um, uh, change in government um, as peace, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing is changing, everything is stable, and so there, and therefore there is peace. And there you really see people defining peace rather than something that is active and that we are building and that we are um, contributing towards, they're defining peace as the absence of mm -hmm the absence of physical violence, because um, it is a very violent society. When you have people who die because they do not have $2 to buy medication, that is extreme violence. Um, when you have you know, um, people who are dying of cholera because they do not have access to drinking water um, in a very rich country, that's extreme violence. Um, but the, the, you know, people who um, put into place an oppressive government have a tendency to say, well, you know, nobody is fighting on the streets, nobody's protesting, um, and therefore there is peace. Um, so I think for, in the Cameroonian context, I would define peace as when we get to that place where we've been able to build the foundation and put into place the systems that allow me to trust you as a Cameroonian, that allow me to say that we're both in this country together, we have a common interest, and therefore I am not going to violate you, and I can trust that you are not going to intentionally violate me in any way, um, not just physically, um, but also violate my right to um, having a, a job, my right to having water, 
um, my right to, you know, choosing the type of lifestyle that, that, that I want to choose for myself. So I think that's how, um, yeah, that's how I would define peace. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is Kawala of Cameroon with the Institute of Women, Peace and Security at Georgetown University. Thank you so much.